Hello, and welcome to today's lecture on Hera. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we are going to investigate the queen of the gods. But life at the top isn't always so glamorous, and Hera spends much of her time trying to prevent Zeus's infidelities. But that makes her very relatable to women in ancient Greek society, for whom she also serves as the goddess of marriage and childbirth. So whether you're trying to rule from Olympus or simply want to prevent your partner from cheating on you, journey with me as we take a look at Hera, Queen of the Gods. Like her husband and brother, Zeus, Hera is the child of the Titans Cronus and Rhea. In fact, she was one of the ones who was eaten whole in Cronus' attempt to avoid his fate. And despite Zeus's philandering, Hera does manage to bear many offspring. Hephaestus, the god of the forge, Aletheia, goddess of childbirth, Hebe, goddess of youth, and Paphon, a monstrous dragon. To identify Hera in her artistic depictions, it's best to look for the symbols of power, her crown and her scepter. Hera is also commonly associated with the peacock, and we'll hear just why that is a little later in this lecture. Because of this, Hera ends up with the cult titles Nymphoiomene, very literally the bride-to-be, and Teleia, the fulfiller of marriage. And because she has to deal with all of Zeus's infidelities, Women in ancient Greece, who have a uh, relative lack of power, especially outside the home, uh, can really relate to this goddess uh, who they look up to um, in the realm of both marriage and childbirth. Like most Greek myths, this one begins with Zeus becoming uncontrollably attracted to a beautiful young woman, this time named Io who just happened to be a priestess of Hera at her cult at Argos. Zeus heads down to Argos to make his move, and he fills the sky with clouds to block out Hera's judgmental gaze. This, of course, only makes Hera more suspicious. She starts parting the clouds and eventually comes down to see what's going on. To hide his infidelity, Zeus turns Io into a beautiful white cow and then tries to convince Hera that no other woman's around at all. In fact, he says, the cow just sprang up like two seconds ago. He didn't have anything to do with it, not one bit. Hera, for her part, knows this is a load of bull. Pun intended. And she demands the cow from Zeus, telling him it shouldn't be a big deal if it's only a cow and not some transformed woman. Eventually, Zeus must relent. So just to recap here, right? Zeus falls in love with a priestess of Hera, goes down, tries to make out with her, makes the clouds appear in the sky to prevent Hera from seeing, and when she does, turns this poor young woman into a cow, trying to claim the cow had just been there all along. Hera's gonna see through that every time, Zeus. Sorry to tell you. Now Hera has been through this sort of thing before, and she knows that Zeus isn't going to stop his pursuit just because Io's a cow. So Hera puts the cow under the guardianship of a giant, Argus Panoptes, or Argus the all Sea. His entire body is covered with eyes, and with a vision and vigilance, there will be no way for Zeus to snatch Io away. Zeus, of course, is completely undeterred. He sends Hermes to do his dirty work. Hermes lulls poor Argus Panoptes to sleep and then promptly slices off his head. A rather grisly fate for doing nothing but trying to help good old Hera. Io was temporarily freed and Zeus was excited to finally be able to go on a date with her, or perhaps even a little bit more. 
And while Argus Panoptes might have wished that Hera would have never come to ask him to help, Hera would always remember the sacrifice of Argus Panoptes. And upon his death, she took all the eyes of Argus, dozens if not hundreds, and placed them upon the feathers of the peacock. And so it's from the giant Argus Panoptes. That's where we get the dots that you see on the feathers of a peacock when it spreads its feathers and struts about. But Hera isn't giving up yet. She sends a biting gadfly to annoy the living daylights out of Io, causing the cow to trample all through Europe, in Asia, and across the seas as well, hence the region and sea of Ionia. She even runs into our old friend Prometheus, who tells her not to worry, because her descendants will eventually give birth to the greatest Greek hero ever, Heracles. Now, Io's made it all the way to Egypt, and that's where she ends up getting turned back into a regular woman. Now, the story has a happy ending here. There, she falls in love with King Telegonus, and he falls in love with her. They get married, they have many beautiful babies, and it's their children's 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 children who eventually ends up being Heracles, the greatest of the Greek heroes. Hera was worshipped in many regions of Greece due to her connection with marriage, a key institution within ancient Greek culture. One of her oldest cults was at the site of Argos, near the gateway between Attica, land of Athens, and the heart of the Peloponnese, home of Sparta. Hera's temple at Argos was known as the Argive Herion, and this temple went through several different constructions over the course of its history. One of the reasons it's important to us as archaeologists today is because a model of one of its earliest phases, dating to around 700 BCE, still exists. And this is one of the only pieces of evidence we have for temple building during the early Archaic period in Greece. While it's just a model of the temple that survives, it still tells us much of the earliest forms of Greek temples. For one, they look rather like houses, and this is fitting because they were indeed the house of the god. For two, they look demonstrably different than the large stone temples of the late Archaic and Classical period. There are two simple columns in front, rather than a peristyle that runs around all four sides and the scale of the components suggests that the original structure itself was far smaller than the Hecatompeda, or 100-foot temples, of the 7th and 6th centuries BCE. Now, understanding the layout and structure of Greek temples is really important for our understanding of how Greek religious practice changed over time. So, for instance, knowing that the, uh, the cult statue is on the inside, it very literally becomes the house of the god. And knowing that the altar is on the outside, well, that tells us that the actual practice by actual people occurs outside of the religious structure itself. Hera's strong power, fertility, and connection with marriage also explains the numerous festivals put on in her honor. And it is no surprise that Argos boasts some of the most famous. The Hecatombaia festival at Argos entails a ritual performance intended to protect the political power of the city, its military men in battle, and the women and children of the polis. During this festival, the priestess of Hera rides in a cart pulled by oxen, bringing new clothes for the cult statue housed within the Argive Herion. A new fire is lit to promulgate the power of Hera for another year and athletic competitions are held to honor the goddess. Now finally, and most spectacularly, a hundred oxen are sacrificed to the goddess Hera. And what do you do with a hundred dead oxen? Well, you eat them, of course. Talk about a divine feast. Another ritual festival in honor of the goddess Hera takes place on the island of Samos. This festival, known as the Tonia, goes all the way back to a legend about pirates invading the island. The story goes that they tried to steal the cult statue of Hera, 
but she made the boat completely unable to move. During the festival, the cult statue was washed in the sea, then bound to a Lugos tree, a symbol of immovability from the pirate legend. There, the statue was offered barley cakes to sustain it for another year. But Hera isn't just about power. We have both textual and archaeological evidence for things like pine cones and pomegranates being associated with the goddess. And this is important because these are both symbols of fertility. And what this makes scholars think is that perhaps prior to her becoming the kind of personified Hera that we see in Greek religion, perhaps this version emerged from an earlier version of something like a mother goddess. So it seems like Hera actually has kind of a tough life dealing with all of Zeus's infidelities. And she tends to punish the, uh, the people who get involved with Zeus more than Zeus himself. But it's actually these kind of difficulties uh, that in part make her a very attractive goddess for women in ancient Greek society. They didn't have a ton of power. They had to deal with these power inequities and being able to look up to somebody who dealt with the same issues is very important for them. And so when we look at Hera, right, we see a goddess uh, of power, but also of marriage and fertility, making her central in ancient Greek society. Just a few lessons we can learn from Hera, queen of the gods. 